Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We have every reason to expect with the passage of the cable bill that we'll need to sell naming rights for this show. <laughs> so folks at home, be thinking about how you would like to rename the show. We're thinking we don't want to call it the AT&T Group necessarily, but we'll see what happens as time goes on. Joining me for the current Donahue Group uh, um, show today, Cal Potter, former state senator. Tom Pineski, University of Wisconsin Sheboygan math professor. Joining him with a sweater vest, Ken Risto, who is the curriculum and assessment coordinator for the social studies area of the Sheboygan Area School District. Me, I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm a lawyer here in town, and we're here to talk about state issues. Um, lots going on. Should we all just stand up and cheer for the fact that we finally have, we a, have budget? a budget? Yay. We would if we were not hooked up to microphones. What do you think? Man, what a process. Well, it's nice they got it done, but it was late, and there was a cost. I mean, if you look at the news media every day, there's various units of government trying to figure out what they got and what they didn't get, and they shouldn't be in that position. And a lot of them are scrambling now to try to find money so, to make up for what they thought they were going to get and not, not going to get. And it's really sad for those folks because some politicians in Madison didn't get their act together. I mean, they should have played politics for a month or two and then did their job, but they screwed around until, well, until the governor signed it uh, at the end of October. Before we go into any of the, the particulars about the budget, um, which I think is probably not all that remarkable given the amount of time it took to pass, uh, the process was interesting. Um, governor Doyle had promised to call the legislature into special session to talk about campaign finance reform and, and so forth. And that uh, promise has apparently been withdrawn. There was great discussion, much discussion during the budget process of this being used as really a primary fundraiser or fundraising time for members of the legislature. So they were in no rush to pass a budget. I've asked this question, I know, more than once on, on, on our program here, but what will it take, if anything, for legislators, but let me rephrase that. What will it take for the people of Wisconsin to get so mad about this? You remember, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. All of us leaning out of our windows and yelling that, what's it gonna take? To, I mean, this is, this is just crazy. Well, when we have to pay 50 or 60% out of our pocket uh, in taxes, then we'll get mad. Until then, I don't think we'll get mad. We'll just say that's the cost of doing business. I mean, Either that or we have a replication of maybe what happened on the, on the federal level. Um, when you look at the, what Congress, you know, people say, well, Democrats haven't done a heck of a lot in Congress, but in the area of uh, lobby reform and ethics reform, they've done some very substantial uh, changes. And they've done it because of the number of people who were caught uh, in with their indiscretions. And I think what has happened on the state level, the Koala, and the Jensen, and the Fodi, uh, and Ladvig uh, were just sort of poster children of two years ago. And people have sort of, with the passage of time, probably can't even recall those recall names. Recall the names, And yeah. so I think you need a, a resurrection of corruption. And then people, I think people's attention span due to the complexity of society and the number of things that they have to deal with in their lives, their family, jobs, and so on, have a very mm -hmm. short attention span to politics. And unless there's something of a major uh, fiasco where the news media comes out and says, throw the bums out, the people are not being led into that direction. Mm -hmm. And I think politicians generally see that. And they very, very stealthfully have raised all kinds of money during this budget. Their coffers are full, ready for 19, or 2008. And people think, why the hell do we want to change the finance system? This, this cow is giving good milk now, a lot of cream. <laughs> and you know, That's right. we got a fresh one here, let's, let's go. go. And there's no, there's no urgency to do the people's will. Yeah. And I think that's what it's going to take. Yeah. I, you hate to say it, the thing has to break before people fix it, but it seems that that's what happens in our society. Yeah, but even so. when it's broken, I mean, the Koala, Jensen, Fodi, I mean, that was a scandal. Yeah. Um, I know it could get worse, but I'm not sure how much worse. Yeah. And, well, I uh, think the governor, you know, the governor is being chastised by Common Cause, and I'm a member of Common Cause, and, and Jay Heck is, and the governor are really going at it about having a special session. Um, I have not spoken to the governor as to why he has not, mm -hmm. um, but I w I'd be willing to think that some of his aides are saying, 
you're not going to get this thing passed because there isn't the motivation in the, in, in particularly in a conservative assembly. Why do you want to throw a bill out there that goes down in flames and you're the governor who then has lost all his chips, all his chips? Um, I, I think I can't help but think of Hillary Clinton and her, and, um, her efforts in initial days of the Clinton administration to get health care. Mm -hmm. I mean, all kinds of studies and volumes of documents put together about the need and the cost and how it should be st structured. And what happened is that the, the stage was not set for prime time to pass the doggone thing. She went down in flames, and the damn thing now has been inactive for, what, 10 years at least? And, and that's sad. And I think the same thing could happen here. You know, it goes down in defeat, and then people say, well, why should we revisit this? A year ago it went down, you know, two-thirds of the legislature didn't vote for it or some scenario of, the, of, the, of that nature. Yeah. Or just take an incremental, an incremental step and look at Supreme Court, the Supreme Court race. Um, justices, you know, having to, to raise insane amounts of money in order to get elected to a nonpartisan um, office that should be, that should be exempt from, from political influence. Yeah. Silly me to think that, you know, we should have, mm -hmm. you know, our justices <laughs> actually deciding things on the law and, and not on, you know, who's uh, paying them. And truly, I think they do decide things on the law, but, the, the, you know, the pressure, the pressure when you're running in these fairly hotly contested races, and I, I can't help but think that the next Supreme Court race, court race uh, Justice Butler is going to be up and When's that coming up in November, uh, next November? Um, it's it's an April election. Oh, it's in so April, April, so that's April. pretty. That's so coming it's up April pretty quick. of of two thousand eight. Right. Okay. Okay. All that's right. just around. And is the there a Republican who's already declared? There was a Republic. I've I've lost track of this because I've yeah. not seen anything about it for the last month and a half. There was a Republican kind of I I I can't tell you his name. Uh, who has sort of a perennial uh, who runs a great deal for a variety of things. Uh, describes himself as being very, very conservative, but uh, perceived as being rather unelectable to the point where the Chamber of Commerce and other groups that would typically support a conservative Republican judge is, was really pretty much running, fleeing from him. Okay. And they were trying to find someone else to, um, uh, to step up and declare their nomination so they could support that individual rather than yeah. you know, hug this this, <laughs> this hairy bear that they don't want anything to do with. So. Well, let's get back to the hairy bear of the, uh, of the budget. Um, what happened to the, I know your budget, but what happened to the Senate Majority Leader? Why did she get canned? Oh, how interesting. Well, it doesn't huh? take much. Well, let's just set, let's just set the stage. Um, uh, State Senator Judy Robson from Beloit uh, was elected uh, Senate Majority Leader 10 months ago, mm -hmm. not so long ago, and now she it's, shepherded the budget, and then and, after and now it's about a done. week after she was uh, let Russ, go by let the caucus. Go. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Russ I, Decker, yeah, from um, I'm trying to Wausau. from Wausau. Wausau. All right. Um, I, it was no surprise because I think if you look at the winners and losers in the budget battle, it was the conservatives in the assembly who got the most, and the ones who lost the most were the uh, liberal Democrats, and the liberals in in the. Uh, the Senate were the ones who wanted things such as uh, financing for a health care plan, a health care plan, a hospital tax, a number of things were put in which were revenue raisers to do creative things and do good things. Those were the things that were compromised out and who was sitting at the table during the negotiations but Judy Robson. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a, an ax that falls on somebody when it doesn't come out okay. to be at the liking of the caucus. But Cal, I think you had pointed out in a previous show that um, the Senate um, Democrats really put together a very, very liberal budget. I mean, they knew they were gonna lose stuff. Uh, there, I mean, it was, a, it was a budget that was pretty far to one side. And so you set the Senate liberals up against the Assembly conservatives. I mean, I, it was not a middle-of-the-road proposal from the, from no. the Senate. No, yeah, but I, mean, I it think... Good, it was good, but it, it, did, it did involve raising additional money and, and so forth. So, 
But I think people on the left and right always think the, little, the middle of the road is a little bit over the center anyhow, and so I think they're, they're in, the caucus analysis of what they gave up was more substantial than they, they think, and of course, who do you take it out on? You know, people who were at the table, and that's what I think happened. I wasn't there, I haven't talked to any senator about that, but that was my gut reaction when I, when I read it, because uh, I've been through some similar situations where when there has been a, a compromise and a conference committee, people do go back in the caucus and say, what the hell did you give that up for? What's the matter with you? Aren't you defending your caucus members? And, you know, you, you go into a situation where you find blame, and I think some of that was, was here. Okay. And it only takes just a switch of two or three unhappy people to make the, have right. the caucus switch around. I That's mean, right. the Senate's not it that big. It was a close vote. It yeah, was it was a very close vote. Sure. So I would think maybe three people swing, and. Mm -hmm. You're, you find yourself no longer sure. majority. And they could leader. have been the author of the health care plan or the yep. hospital tax yeah. or a number of the things that were, were sure. dropped. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it, it was interesting. And in the, the article that I read just basically indicated that there was the thought that she just was not aggressive enough. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me there was plenty of aggression in this budget process. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, aggression to the point of, uh, of a stalemate that was not what legislators do. Maybe what politicians do, but legislators should be about the people's business mm -hmm. of putting together a budget and understanding not everybody gets what he or she wants. But, well, I'll climb off my soapbox and, <laughs> and talk a little bit about what winners and losers in the budget process substantively. I mean, we know that um, we're going to be paying more for, uh, to register our cars. Um, and uh, driver's licenses and so forth. Yep. Tom's got a list. No, I don't have a list. <laughs> uh, yeah, I heard on the radio. Huh? Cost, I just gave birth to a child, and I send in my money, and I get a note from the state. Oops, you owe more for birth certificates and everything else. So as you give birth, uh, expect to pay more. Well, if that's... <laughs> I assume, I assume this, the same is true of dying. As probably, well, yeah, somebody's yeah. got to pay, right? My check's in the coffin. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I don't smoke, but, uh, you know, a dollar, a dollar increase on the tax. I mean, What's I'm, interesting, though, is that I think that still puts it as the number 17 or whatever. It's, I know. It's double digit. So other states have really passed us up on this. I thought that was a, a very in, high increase, and I thought we'd be three or four. But when I saw what we really were, I thought, well, God, they had, there was more wiggle room here than I thought. Exactly. That's, exactly. On, that's on a pack of cigarettes, right? Yes. Right. So how many packs are uh, 24? In a, so that's about $48. You buy a carton, it's $48 in tax, just about. That's why I hear a talk like there's going to be Groups traveling to Illinois, buying cigarettes, and coming back to the, uh, make, Wisconsin. Make, make and no mistake, when we talk about <laughs> drug abuse, um, as far as I can tell, in the vast panoply of drugs that are abused in this country that cause the greatest amount of personal pain and fiscal strain, it is tobacco. Why don't we outlaw Far, We don't. Far we, we need the revenue. Well, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's money. <laughs> Well, and you'd be as successful at outlawing cigarettes as you were as uh, getting rid of alcohol, alcohol and, and sure, so that's forth. True. But yeah. I think that um, anyone who thinks that you know uh, tobacco addiction is, is some victimless. benign. I always, I always supported increases in the gas ta or in the, in the cigarette tax, and smokers would come back and say, "Well, this is victimless. I, I, it's my choice." I said, "Do you realize that just in their medical assistance alone, it costs the state something like five hundred million dollars a year to take care of people who are dying of cancer or emphysema or heart disease or whatever malady they got from their smoking habit?" I said, "So the taxpayer is." helping you with your medical bills because you choose to do something stupid like smoke. Right. So I, I have no sympathy for people who think this is a sort of targeting them. They, you're right, they shouldn't, we shouldn't have cigarettes, but how far does government go in well, telling people yeah. to, to prohibit things? We went through this with prohibition, it didn't work. It didn't I think work. the same thing yeah. would happen with this, so the best thing to do is just tax it. Keep taxing until nobody buys it and then, uh, then we have a revenue source driven, exactly. uh, wiped yeah. out. Well, the, the budget did include money for an expansion of um, our beloved Highway 23 from Plymouth to Fond du Lac, which is only 19 miles, according to the newspaper. Oh, well, it's to past me, Plymouth already. <laughs> past Plymouth, that is true. <laughs> and it That's often, good. That's good. It often, I never actually mind the drive, even when I'm behind a semi, because it's so beautiful. But it is a tr it can be. It can be a tricky drive. And, uh, of course, you in the legislature must have driven that millions of times and uh, 
Um, according to the DOT, there is no need for this four-lane highway from Plymouth to Fond du Lac until about 2020. Cal, you were talking about the first rumblings of the expansion of Highway 23 back in the 80s? Was well, it? it goes back further than that. Uh, the, the road was built to Plymouth under Pat Lucy's administration, and Pat Lucy was in the 1970s. And when Pat Lucy left to become uh, the ambassador to Mexico, um, then it was Martin Schreiber as lieutenant governor who became the governor, served about a year, then ran against Lee Dreyfus, and Lee Dreyfus with his red vest and school bus and his charisma uh, just threw the bum out, <laughs> literally just mm -hmm. wiped them off, off out of the uh, executive mansion. And that was the end of the uh, termination of the project. The project was to continue after that. Uh, Carl Adi and I were both in the assembly at that time, and we had talked to Martin Schreiber and said, it's logical, we're at Plymouth, uh, let's go all the way. The last was more than 19 miles at that time, but it was okay, he, said he agreed to it, and we were going, to head, going ahead. And so politics intervened, a different administration, uh, different legislators that were involved, and as a result, the pie and the money went elsewhere. There's always been, interesting enough, and I get a kick out of uh, the local politicians here too who, who cry about the fact that there's uh, no money there. There's, no, there's not enough money for all the projects that are promised throughout this state. It's always been that way. The legislature has got, uh, every district has got a four lane road someplace practically. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the reasons the legislature put in that indexing of the gas tax is because it was the only way that you could tr somewhat keep up with the maintenance and the construction costs, is if uh, periodically due to construction cost increases in inflation, you would tweak the gas tax every few months. Well, last session, the it legislature and their holiness said, oh, it's tax, tax without representation, and they, they put it down the toilet, and as a result, uh, you had no way of ever keeping up with Highway 23 or any other road. Well, in this budget, we have a, we're seeing an increase, what, to $75 for the registration of a car. Mm -hmm. But I've been willing to bet that is going to be far short of what the need is. And so this politics uh, continues. Whose district is going to get their project funded before others? There is a projects uh, review commission that does prioritize, and Highway 23 was somewhat lower and the local legislators moved it up on the list and now it's back down on the list. It went from 09, I guess, is from oh. legislative action to, two, to 13, 2013, okay. back where it was under the Projects Commission. So it's going to be built, it's just a matter of when, but I can tell you there's, there's a lack of revenue uh, to fund these type of projects. They're extremely expensive They're today. They're insanely expensive. And, and, with, you know, and it's getting worse because not only with the cost of oil, blacktop, if you want to even use blacktop, is becoming very close to, close to cement in cost. And cement right. has gone to the roof because a lot is going over to China and other developing nations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just becoming almost more difficult to try to even keep up with this list or gnaw into the list of projects that are out there. And, and those of us who drove a lot to Madison back and forth, of course I remember in the old days where you'd go through Sheboygan Falls and you'd go through Plymouth and you went through Glen, um, Greenbush and you, you know it really did take some amount of time because we, <laughs> I mean it, it really is you know fairly quick. And 151 quick. bypass will be opened, completed this fall. That's, so there you that go. That takes a lot of time off the trip. It, it really does. But it takes an extraordinary length of time to do one mile. Mm -hmm. I remember the from Fond du Lac to to Madison to complete that four lane. Or when did the 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 basic the new construction? It was years and years. Sure. About and, ten miles a year or so. And at when the you most. oh, and I think that's actually fairly quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I remember driving to Madison two three years through construction, and and it really is. Amazingly expensive, amazingly time-consuming, and it's nice when it's done, but uh, yeah. um, it, re it really is a, it's a... It, it, and it's difficult for a state, you know, one of the things that uh, some European countries, some Germans have come over here and they've commented how sometimes our roads are kind of bumpy and so on. Well, we have a state that's about the size of Germany, but what do they have, 80 million people and we have 
5.2 million. Yeah. So you're trying to finance a system of roads in this big mass of geography with about 5 million people. It's very, it's very difficult over in Europe where they even rely on, on trains and other means of transportation even more. They build roads to last. The Germans, you hear stories of how much gravel and stone they put under the concrete and how thick the concrete is on the, the Autobahn. But it's a, it's a large populated country in a rather small geographic area. Sure. So we really do have to, not only because of the number of projects and the maintenance there of all these roads, but you, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to finance is what it is. A point well taken, and that leads to the fact that Highway 23 is dead because of Governor Doyle's veto. Um, in my day, we called it the Vanna White veto. Um, when you'd take a letter <laughs> and... Uh, well, this one, Tommy oh, Thompson was in, they were kind of... <coughs> they were the kind of, they called it Vanna White. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now, of course, poor Governor Doyle is guilty of the Frankenstein <laughs> veto. Oh, you got to give it another name, right? What the heck? <laughs> I have always thought the Democrats did challenge in court, uh, to, all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the Vanna White veto. Um, that expression coined by one of my colleagues in legal services, uh, Bob Anderson, who was a, a, a lobbyist at that time, um, and Chief Justice uh, Nathan Heffernan from Sheboygan upheld um, the, uh, the veto as constitutional. And uh, of course, Tommy Thompson was a master at the Vanna White veto. It has been changed to some extent um, uh, in the early 90s, the, 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 there was, a, I think, a constitutional mm -hmm. amendment, as I remember, too. Mm -hmm. But there are now some new creative ways of doing this. I think it stinks, just in general. I, th I think it's a usurpation of the, of the legislative um, function by the executive. I don't have problems with vetoes, but to be able to go through line by line and, and reverse intent in many cases. and reverse intent and effect, um, and it's even not a good thing. Increase dollars in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. They you know cross out mm -hmm. no more than or but they that sure. goes and then right. mm -hmm. yeah. add some zeros somewhere from later on down the. Yeah. And I know that Republicans. I, I just read with uh, one of our state senators who just just livid about this, but I just you know want to remind him and and. And readers that uh, and listeners that this was um, well. Tommy Thompson uh, honed it to a fine art. Um, oh, he was. When brilliant you look at back it. at the budgets that that I, I served, I began serving under uh, Pat Lucy and Marty Schreiber and even uh, Lee Dreyfus and uh, eventually Tony Earl. None of them used the veto pen to this extent that's now being used today under uh, the Doyle and Thompson. Uh, Thompson broke ground. It went to the court, and the court said, "Well, legislature, if you don't like it, change the change, oh, change it." You know, it. and well, they didn't want to change it because if their governor was in power, they want him to. They want their governor to be able to use this tool. So that's the court really simply said, "If you don't like it, don't come to us screaming. Do it, fix it yourself." Fix it legislatively. Although I think there was that's a good right. constitutional argument um, that essentially the executive branch was was taking over legislative function mm -hmm. by these tiny, tiny little vetoes. And I know they talk about it at the national level. And goodness gracious, no. I, I don't know. Professor Risto, what do you think in terms of um, constitutional issues or just uh, separation of powers? You're our social studies guy. Well, yeah, I, the state of Wisconsin, like some governors, like a, like a lot of states, give governors that kind of discretion, and and I'm very uncomfortable with having governors have that kind of that kind of authority. I think one of the hallmarks, as we all learned in civics class, was the power of the purse, and and it belongs in the hands of elected legislators, and and this really makes it two things. First of all, it's a use like you said, a usurpation of legislative power that in America has always belonged to legislators, uh, but also it makes I would think, as I look at legislation. I would think it makes legislation just awfully wordy because you have to, as you craft legislation, think about how the governor is going to be creative in the way he moves words and letters or phrases around. So I would think it would make laws even more obscure or difficult to understand. I know as I read Wisconsin statutes compared to some other states, it sure seems awful wordy and awfully, awfully obscure. So I don't think it serves anybody. Um, now that being said, it, it looks like there is some body of evidence, and it's really tough because comparing states is apples and oranges. There seems to be a pattern that states that have this sort of power for governors tends to reduce state expenditures, the size of government. So that's why there are people who want to give the president that sort of authority because it's a way of 
really honing in on uh, reducing government spending. Um, the, the, the problem, of course, you could... Yeah, well, the problem, of course, is when the framers nationally wrote the Constitution, they envisioned that the president would get separate appropriations bills. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so now, of course, Congress has taken, and both parties have taken that to a new level, and they've created these omnibus you know, expenditure bills where everything and anything is in there, and then the president's stuck with you know, signing the whole thing or vetoing the whole yeah. thing. And so it's, it's moved beyond the intention of the framers. There's no question about that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Um, the word is that it's it's uh, the the veto is on rocky ground and uh, the Frankenstein veto. So we'll just have to we'll just have to see how it goes. But I think I think it is an interesting you know balance between them. And both Democrats and Republicans need to remember that if they enact something that helps them when they're out of power, it's going to help the other party as well. And and. Uh, uh, they should just be more philosophical if, about if it. If they did it purely legislative, I mean, the governor doesn't have a veto in this. They, the, is that correct? If the legislature says we want to make a constitutional amendment, we propose it, we pass it, and the governor can't veto it. No, it, it, it goes to the governor. It goes to the electorate. It goes to the electorate and has to be passed again, uh, or at least twice. Two, two sessions. Two then sessions. To the electorate. So mm -hmm. that choice is out of the governor's veto. Okay. Uh, correct. Uh, uh, no, there seems to be, at least in certain areas, a, a dialogue during the budgetary process where the governor at least makes promises that he isn't going to m monkey mm -hmm. around with certain sections. So there is sort of a, a discussion of what areas are, are in bounds and what areas are out of bounds for the governor to play this game. Because I know I, that was going on this last right. time around. Was that going on with, with you as well when you were there? Uh, it sometimes occurs, but we did not have the stalemate like we had here. Most oh. of the years that I was in, we were able to resolve our budget differences uh, earlier. Well, mm -hmm. just think about how little your campaigns cost. Yeah, my first Did campaign was $3,000. Wow. <laughs> I, don't know. I spent $276 to get elected <laughs> to the school board. <laughs> what a wait, no. <laughs> it was, it, that, yeah, I mean, that's, that really is pretty remarkable. Um, we have a lot to talk about in just a couple of minutes left. Um, the human TIF plan, in fact, we only have one minute left, so there are other things. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of things the that uh, we'll just have to tune into, including ways of, of prospering the state through um, interesting funding for universities, uh, the Wisconsin Covenant, but this human TIF district uh, concept that we were talking about. I continue to be very interested in, in Lake Michigan water levels and intergovernment cooperation to address just this catastrophic, in my view, event and so forth. But we've got 15 seconds. so. I just want to say thanks to Brett Favre. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, it's a good year. Like what, what, what a class act that guy is, you know. Good PR for the state, isn't it? <laughs> it's yes. good PR, but this is a man who, in spite of being attacked and revered, and it really seems to happen, you know, just on, depending on what the score is, is unfailingly polite in his public discourse, yeah. and I think he is a wonderful example of just a plain old class act. We're wrapping it up for number four. Go Pack, go Badgers, and we'll see you all again sometime soon. <laughs>